If you're looking for a content explaining the latest improvement done by the admission controller, and moreover, what's the benefit for us, then this episode is for you. Welcome back to the Is It Observable YouTube channel. Today's episode is going to be part of the Kubernetes series where we had lots of episodes. If you follow this channel, I covered a few months ago several topics related to security, including the introductions to OPA Gatekeeper, providing a policy engine using a language called Rego. OPA is clearly not the only solution helping us to secure our cluster, but all those solutions rely on the admission controller of Kubernetes to register their webhook and be able to react to our workload before they are even scheduled. Since Kubernetes 1.26, the community has worked on many features improving the admission controller. Now, with Kubernetes 1.33, part of this enhancement is included by default in our cluster, and the rest will be required to be enabled through a feature flag. This episode is here to answer to all our questions. What does this new admission controller provide to us, and is it observable? If you enjoyed this content, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. So let's see what we're going to cover in this episode. We'll start presenting the actual admission controller. We will briefly explain what is SEAL, the new language used by the admission controller. We explain the various CRD and share a few examples. And last, how can we actually observe any policy violations that we have created in the admission controller? If for those who never heard about the admission controller, let me remind what's the purpose of it. When you're deploying a resource like a deployment or a pod or a namespace or whatever, that request will go through a series of steps before it's accepted by Kubernetes and installed in the cluster. So our request hits the API server and it verifies the authentication of the user. And then it starts all the workflow related to the admission controller that validates that our requests before it's actually been stored in the objects in a city. We have three steps in the admission controller. We have mutating admission. These steps can modify resources like adding uh, a default label or annotations to our workload. Mutating admission will send a webhook request to any solution in charge of doing mutation in our workload. Mutation is typically where most of the operator uh, will basically be registered. For example, the open telemetry operator, this is where, for example, it's able to inject uh, the collector as a sidecar or to add the uh, instrumentation libraries as an init container. Uh, so this is the magic. And then also something for Istio, it adds their sidecar proxy. So there are many solutions that interact with these steps of the admission controller. Next is the schema validation. So it checks that the workload plus the potential changes done by the operator are respecting the specs. Then we have the validating admission. This applies checks on the resources against predefined rules. This is where we can reject or produce Kubernetes events if a resource is not respecting our policies. It will send a notification to any solution that has registered the webhook. This is where all the policy engine will register to apply the various policies that we have created. So this framework is the foundation for solutions like Kyverno or OPA Gatekeeper. Basically, they will rely on the admission control. So OPA Gatekeeper or Kyverno has lots of features, but to summarize, they can mutate to add required labels or security context or whatever, or in the opposite, could be validating our deployments our cluster. This will allow to enforce policies like ensuring that all pods have resource defined, uh, blocking privilege containers, or automatically adding labels or annotations, or simply validating the image registry that is aligned with our, our standards, or even if there's a signature. Once the admission controller has done its work, our resource is finally stored in etcd, and the scheduler will pick up the new record in etcd and start the process of finding a node for our future workload. But since several months, uh, the committee has worked on major improvements in the admission controller. In fact, it reminds me a bit of the work done by the Gateway API that provides a common set of objects to define gateways and network routes. Here is the idea, as you can imagine, it's not going to be related to the network anymore, uh, 
of because of the admission controller, but on the main steps of the admission controller, meaning mutating workload or validating workload. Since Kubernetes 1.26, Every feature was under a specific feature flags, and if we had this on option to enable, we will getting as an extra set of CRDs allowing us to create mutations and validation rules. Those CRDs are validating admission policies and validating admission policy bindings. And then we have the same for mutations, so the mutating admission policy and the mutating admission policy uh, policy binding. Since version 1.33, the validating admission CRDs and, and bindings are deployed by default in version 1. So if you want to get advantage of the mutating CRDs and the features that goes with it, you will have to uh, add uh, uh, the feature flag in your API server and configure it properly. So, okay, so new CRDs are now available in our cluster. Wonderful. What does it actually mean? In the networking world, English controller, or now Gateway API, you have a set of standardized uh, API or resources uh, is, that is here to allow us to create routes. But we had to create a provider. The solution is responsible of managing the network. For the admission controller, is it the same thing? Do we have only the implementation or do we have more than that? Well, surprisingly, Yes, you have everything. This update provides the CRDs and the actual implementation. So it means that today I don't have to use any policy engine solution anymore if I only want to use simple mutating policies or validating policies. So that is super exciting from my perspective. The idea behind all those new CRD is that the policy defines a generic rule where we will define which object is targeted by the rule, how to validate or mutate the response, and we can refer to parameter that could be either a config map or a custom object. So the policy at the end is going to be a generic. It's a bit like a sort of a template. We will rely on the bindings to filter to the specific resource or the specific namespace, define the actual parameter that will be used in this specific policy. This design logic re uh, of relying on parameter is great and allow us to use one rule and then customize its behavior based on the value of the parameter stored in a specific namespace or location of our cluster. For example, if I want to set a default annotations to uh, set the team ID of a team in our workload, I will create the following mutating policy. The mutating admission policy structure requires specific sections. There will be the name, uh, the name of the policy or, or the mutation in this case, uh, the failure policy uh, that determine the behavior on mutation failure. Then we have reinvocation policy that controls whether a mutation is reapplied if the object has changed. So if we do an apply, for example, an update, for example. Then we have the match constraints that defines the target resources that follows a bit the RBAC logic with which API group, which objects, which verbs. Then we have the match condition. It's, it's an expression that must be true for mutation to be applied. And then we have the actual mutation object that defines the actual logic of our mutations. Then we have the parameter, parameter section with the kind we can, where it could be a config map or any CRD. So it will basically allow us to point to a dynamic value for external resources. And by doing this, you will see that the language that we're going to use, we can refer to the parameter value. Then once we have this policy defined, we will bind it using mutating admission policy binding, which links the policy to a specific resource or filter, uh, the actual parameter that we were going to use for this binding, uh, the policy at the end is activated if it has at least one binding. Next, for validating admission policy, this policy lets you to define rules that must be met for a resource to be accepted. Or we can also do audit, of course, uh, like any uh, validation policy that we have uh, known in the past using OPA or Caverno. For example, let's say we want to validate that the request and limits are defined in our workload and that the value is not exceeding a value defined in a config map. So it's a parameter. 
So here is the example. As you can see, the structure is similar to the mutating uh, admission policy. So we have a name, so the name of our policy, uh, the failure policy, whether to fail or ignore the validation if it fails, the match constraint, which resource uh, uh, will be applied, and then the validation. So that's the list of expression that must uh, be evaluated to be true. Then the parameter kind, again, uh, so we can use external parameters or config map similar to validating uh, mutating by policies. Then we have audit annotation. We'll see that we we'll talk to a bit later once we comes to uh, the actual observability. So it's optional. Uh, basically, it's going to be a way of adding extra metadata to the audit log produced. Very interesting. We'll, we'll talk about this later. Then uh, you bind the policy using the validating admission policy binding, which connects the policy to the actual resource and Optionally, we provide the parameter and the value of the config map we're going to use. This is amazing because a vanilla, vanilla community cluster allows us to apply mutation and validation policy without relying on any specific solutions. So out of providing both objects, it also provides another object called validating admission webhook configuration and mutating admission webhook configuration that allows a third party solutions to register on each steps and do some extra work or, or, or utilize their engine to do the validations. As you saw in the two examples, so both on the mutating and on the uh, validating policies that I showed you, um, it, there is uh, something very specific. It relies on a language that defines our conditions uh, for our mutations or validations and the actual steps that we're going to do are all for mutating our objects or in the opposites to validate the two. And this language is very specific. It's called CEL. CEL stands for Common Expression Language and was initially created by Google. If you're curious about the specs, you can find them on the following URL. So the GitHub, Google, and then you have the cell specs for there. So why is cell important in communities? Well, cell gives us a standardized declarative way of writing validations and mutation logic without needing to build custom admission webhooks. And that, I think, is just simply huge. And because cell is becoming a standard, we are starting to see broad adoptions across policy engines. For example, Caverno already supports uh, the CL language. But no surprise there. But what's really exciting is that OPA Gatekeeper, which traditionally relies on Arigo, now supports Cell in its latest versions. That is just a major shift for that tooling. Cell is designed to work with a structured data like JSON or YAML files, which makes it perfect for Kubernetes. In most cases, when you manipulate uh, the object, you will rely on an object. And the root object in cell is not like a, in, in JavaScript, uh, the actual window. It is simply the representing the Kubernetes resources that is being evaluated or, in the opposite, mutating. Let's look at a few examples. So we have object.metadata.labels, and now we can put the equal equal platform. This expression checks if a resource has a label team equal platform. Object spec containers all, you can see, and then we put resource limits uh, different from nothing. This one is amazing. It's ensured that every container in that resource has a CPU limit defined. Cell supports all the usual operators, so arithmetic, logical, and an R with uh, and an R, so the, the two syntax, even functions to check if a field exists. So for example, we can say object metadata label exists and then stop. We can also get the size. So it could be the string, so it could be the length of a string. It could, for a list or a map, it could be the actual number of items in uh, the map of the list. So uh, here you can have an example. So metadata label size uh, above zero. So meaning that we have at least more than one label in our notation. And yes, cell also supports a regular expression too. So you can do string dot matches and then our regular expressions and we can check that it match our regular expressions. So there are a couple of advanced seal features. So cell includes powerful functions for working with lists and map, similar a bit to the experience that we have with JavaScript or Python. So you can use filter, map, exists, and all express in a complex logic. So here's an example. So this expression that will ensure that 
all the environment variable named myenv has an alphabetic values only. You can also combine multiple conditions, nest expressions, and use shortcut logic to build robust policies. The default admission controller are not exposing specific metrics or logs, but you can collect details utilizing on one of the feature providing on a CRD, like discussed before, so the one on validating admission policies and the mutating admission policy. And then remember, I, I briefly mentioned it's, there is a field called audit annotations. Audit annotation is optional field for both CRD and allow us to expose extra details that will be available in the audit log produced. For example, in the request validations on the request and limit, we could report the actual request of the workload. So here is the example with edit uh, audit annotations. We can put a key for that uh, specific annotations and the, the actual expression to get the value. So here you can say that we get the name and then we put uh, the actual uh, value of the request. To get the audit logs, you will need, of course, to enabling it. So when using a cloud provider, usually have an options when spinning up your cluster to enable the audit log from your Kubernetes clusters. Manually, you will have to pass extra args to the API server. So here, dash dash audit policy, and then uh, the where the file will be located, uh, where I will be writing the audit logs, uh, the, the size, and so on and so forth. Here, the logs will be produced in the node slash var slash log slash Kubernetes slash audit logs, but it could be customized, of course. Once this is enabled, we need to configure how the audit log will be produced. For, for example, so we need to create an audit uh, policy where we can capture all the uh, evaluation that is in failing or audit, uh, and we can add uh, extra details. So you will have to configure the audits to have the right details produced in your logs. Then once you have everything set up, the audit plus the audit log produced plus the policy, we need to use a log agents, so FrameBits or the open collector. Uh, and of course, we need to mount the host path slash var slash log slash Kubernetes audit log on the log agent pod. And then we simply need to use tail if you use FrameBit or the file log receiver to read the content uh, of this audit log produced. On the metric, the API server exposed by default metrics about the admission webhook. So we could use uh, the Prometheus receiver from uh, the open collector to scrape that metrics from uh, the Kubernetes API server. So we can collect uh, the API server's uh, controller admission duration. Uh, we can look at uh, the web hook admission duration per seconds, the latency of the webhook based on the controller, um, the latency of the admission with the sub-steps. Uh, so we can basically figure out where we're spending time in which step of the admission controller stage, like described at the introduction. So this is going to be very important to get more details. That's it for today's episode related to the admission controller. I think this improvement of the admission controller is just fantastic. Having a common set of CRDs to define your policies, it's going to be so wonderful, especially if you have different cluster or different client using OPA and Carveno. If you use that standardized formats, I guess, it will be supported by both solutions, and then you just have a common language. I think the CAL language as well, because both Caverno and OPA supports it, will make the design of our policy in a much, much, much simpler way. And also in the language, I think my from my perspective, it's very simple, uh, simple to read. And also if you look at around, there's a lot of functions that you can take advantage to build very complex roles. So with a very limited number of lines, you can do very amazing validations or mutating uh, policies. The other thing that I like, to be honest, is the fact that uh, you can make a reference to a parameter, so create a template rule, and then the rule, depending on the namespace, uh, the, the request values or uh, the, the team ID will be depending on a config map that is located in that namespace. So it means that one rule could make a lot of sense for different namespaces, and it will simplify so much way, so much the design experience that we have uh, in, within our policies. If you enjoyed today's content, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. So see you soon for another episode. Bye.